name is Lane. I'm a science editor for The Sun, and I'm here today with Sasha Sagan, author, podcast host, producer, and daughter of astronomer Carl Sagan and science communicator Ann Jurian. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Lane. It's so nice to be here. Oh, we're so glad to have you. It's we really a pleasure. appreciate you coming out. Uh, so I have your book here, For Small Creatures Such As We, which was published a few years ago, and it's about finding meaning, especially from a secular perspective, and rituals which usually aren't seen as something that is available or accessible to people who have secular beliefs. Um, and you're also in town in Ithaca right now because you're giving a sort of a panel later today regarding the eclipse. Yes. Um, in this book, you talk a lot about how rituals have gone back through time and using science to sort of find meaning. And with the upcoming eclipse, that seems like a really exciting opportunity for that. Yeah, I mean, it's so amazing because when I, as I was researching my book, what I loved was that it was like, and when you peel back the specifics of time and place and like the set and the costumes, it was like we were all celebrating the same things as human beings around the world in disparate cultures. And it came down so often to scientific phenomena, whether it was, um, you know, astronomical phenomena like the equinoxes and the solstices, um, or it was biological events like birth and coming of age. It was like we dressed them up so differently, but we were all, we all found the same touchstones all over the world throughout history. And the eclipse falls into that really <laughs> smoothly. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's been so often seen as like this harbinger of doom, which makes sense, right? We are so, um, the sun is a crucial, central part of our existence. We owe it everything. I mean, it's so funny. I was thinking on the walk over here, the newspaper is also named for the sun. And it's like, you see it all over, you know, Sunday. We, we, we emphasize without sometimes unwittingly how much our nearest star is at the center of everything for us. And when it goes away, it's a little bit unsettling. <laughs> and I think that, you know, seeing that as something, especially if you believe that there is a deity or deities that are concerned with your behavior and approve and disapprove of what we humans do, it's really scary when there's an eclipse. But I think what's so amazing, what science has given us is not only the relief that, okay, no one's mad at us <laughs> when there's an eclipse, but also that um, it's something really beautiful that is very specific to our planet, at least in our solar system. The moon is the right size and the right distance to create this beautiful thing for us. And I think it's worthy of celebration. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so in your book, you discuss um, in particular how a lot of times science has almost lost this magic when we talk about it to people. Um, and I was wondering what sort of ways do you see as maybe school systems or other methods of connecting with people as sort of bringing that magic back into science? Such a good question, Lane. I think that so much of it is about enthusiasm. And one of the things that I admire so much about both my parents and one of the things I think that they, my father did and my mother continues to do so masterfully is this idea that like when we can, you know, once we learn something, um, it becomes sort of, we become kind of blase about it. And children are very enthusiastic about things. And, you know, somehow, unless you have a really inspired science teacher along the way, you get kind of like um, bored with it. It doesn't seem as special as it could. And I think that we lose something so important there. The example I always give that I don't think I will ever get over my whole life is there is a secret code in your blood that connects you to your ancestors, to everyone who ever lived, to all life on earth. It can solve mysteries, lost to time, connect people who never knew that they were related, um, it solve historical mysteries. And by the time you learn about like alleles and you're like doing a worksheet in middle school, DNA seems like so ordinary, or maybe it's only framed like in the true crime context, you know? But this idea that there is this amazing code that can answer ancient questions is so powerful. And I feel like if you could get the, I mean, one of the things I really admire about religion, even though I'm not religious, is the way in which you know, a great preacher or rabbi or cleric can tell a story and make an audience feel how deeply it impacts them. 
And I wish that more of science education had that feel to it, but the content was, you know, the <laughs> evidence-based marvels of nature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this sort of brings me to a slightly tangential topic, but also I think related. Um, we're currently in a state right now where it feels like there's a lot of disconnect between science and the public, yes. whether it's vaccines and COVID or other sort of um, regulatory science. How do you see this idea of bringing excitement and, and magic back into science, if you see it as possibly playing a role in connecting with the public? A hundred percent. And I think that, you know, one of the things that my father believed so strongly was in order to have a functioning democracy, you need a scientifically literate voting base. Um, you know, we need people to understand not just, I mean, yes, the specific science of, that impact their lives, of course, but also just the idea that the scientific method, it's not that science is one list of facts and then there's other lists of facts and you choose the one you like. It's that there is an error correcting mechanism. And when something doesn't stand up to scrutiny because we have more information, we let it go. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have to change our minds because it means we learned something. And I think that idea, we're so, it's so hard for us human beings to say, I was wrong. And my most deeply held belief, <laughs> the hill I was willing to die on was not based on something real. And there must be some evolutionary advantage to digging our heels in <laughs> millennia ago, but I think it's something we have to try to move past. And I think the idea that, you know, it's not, science isn't something to be like, intimidated by and sure we have along the way we have made wrong turns and we always do because we're human beings but the idea that there is an engine that allows us to correct those mistakes i think is what's so powerful and yeah i mean if we had real enthusiasm like if we really when small children are like so eager for questions i mean this is what i think is such a big part of it is children love to ask questions they're so curious and they're so eager for answers and sometimes that makes adults uncomfortable because they don't, we, they, we, <laughs> the adult, um, don't know the answer. And um, if, if we're, we feel insecure and we feel embarrassed or we're, it's something we struggle with, you know, questions about death, questions about the meaning of life. It's something where we're torn and it's hard for us to say, I don't know. It's hard for us to say, I used to feel this way. Now I'm starting to think this. I don't know. I lay awake at night and look at the feeling, worrying about it. Um, or, well, your grandmother thinks this. Your other cousin thinks this. We can't agree. And I think sometimes the problem is that we don't trust that children can handle nuance and complex ideas. But I really think they can. Absolutely. Um, something you brought up reminded me that I wanted to ask. Um, in your book, you share an anecdote where you were out to lunch and you overheard someone talking about tarot cards and oh, other yes. things. No, I was at dinner. I was with her. It was like a big group dinner. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and you shared how you reacted adversely to that because you were like, oh, that, you know, why would you believe in that? Um, and then felt sort of bad about it after yes. and shared your moral of how um, sometimes you ended up going out to lunch with her again yes. and, and connecting with her and finding those connections, even if yes. you had differences. Uh, in a time where it feels especially polarizing or where we get caught in sort of echo chambers on social media, um, is there anything you would like to comment on that yes. based on... Yeah, based on no, I was, it, I was a total jerk about it. And I still, like, it's not that I was wrong about... I, do, I am skeptical about, like, I mean, skeptical is an understatement. I do <laughs> not believe in astrology and tarot cards and things like that. And I think, as a side note, I think... What I do understand about it is we long to feel connected to the universe and to the earth and things like crystals and stuff like that, I think artificially give us that sense. Um, but there's so much of science that is tangibly, provably real that can provide that feeling. But anyways, it's very, obviously it's a, it's very popular um, in certain, you know, places, this kind of stuff. And the, you know, I wish I had approached it differently with this woman who I know who I um you know and I was a jerk and I was like you don't really believe that that's so silly and like said like rude stuff that I should not have said and I really regret that and I think that we all have this 
um, you know, it's really hard when you vehemently disagree with someone to express your disagreement in a way that doesn't make them feel bad. And the paradox is it doesn't work. It do, you're never going to convince anyone because we, well, how our brains are, <laughs> funny, strange brains are wired that actually that makes us white knuckle dig in deeper to our beliefs, even if they're totally um, incorrect. And so I think that there is another way. And I think that presenting our perspective in a joyful, positive way as another way forward rather than, you know, I don't think it's my job to tell anyone not to, you know, in terms of religion and things like that, to dissuade anyone. What I want to offer and what I hope to offer is um, a way to have the joy and pleasure and awe and the rhythms of life that we all for millennia have craved um, without feeling like we're going through the motions if we don't believe in, um, you know, the stuff that's maybe not substantiated by evidence. I think my next question would be, uh, particularly in terms of medicine and trust, yeah. um, I recently read a paper that was talking about um, how sort of presenting the facts, um, like we mentioned earlier, it leaves out some of the ideas of magic and it doesn't feel satisfying to people mm. uh, when they're just given a, a treatment or told to get a vaccine and mm -hmm. they're like, I don't know where this is coming from. It doesn't feel like it's necessarily for their needs. Uh, how do you see in your book, you talk a lot about rituals and almost this secular spirituality, um, if you find that to be an accurate way to describe it. And how do you see that as possibly playing into building trust among, uh, whether it be physicians, medical professionals, as well as just science and the public in general? It's a really interesting question. I mean, it's funny because, you know, on some level it is magic. It is amazing, you know, what we have been able to understand and accomplish in the last century or two about the human body. And we still have a long way to go. And as I said before, we have made some mistakes along the way and what real harm has been caused to real people in those situations and that's really bad um but sometimes i feel like we don't look backwards and think of all the um ways in which we have improved so dramatically and you know one of the things that stands out to me always is you know i have two children and for most of human history giving birth and still for a lot of people a lot of people around the world today, um, it is, it was, it was, and is really dangerous, you know? And I think that I'm, you know, the beneficiary of such amazing advancements in medical science that when I, you know, went in to have each of my children, I was not scared for my life. And that is a relatively recent development in human history. And it needs to be said, something that has not been evenly distributed that sense of relief and, and that, and that's something that we must change. But I do think that, um, you know, we, yeah, it would be great to have a clearer medical communication and understanding, um, for people. And, and it would be great if we learned younger how medical science works and why it works. Um, and I think it would be something that kids would be really interested in from a young age. I mean, who doesn't have a doctor's kit, you know, as a, as a child and who doesn't have that interest of how, how these things work. And it is, I mean, I, we call hand sanitizer potion. I write about it in the book with my kids and it's like, and this is pre COVID. Um, I, but like this idea that, you know, you have this substance that you rub on your hands and it does protect you, not a hundred percent, but it does protect you from disease. Like, that is magic. And on some level, that must be seen as magic. Absolutely. Um, this is something that I was more personally curious about. So uh, in a world where a lot of times pseudoscientific products yeah. are uh, sold or yes. promoted under the guise of science, I have a couple questions related to that. The first being, why do you think there is this need to sort of label it as science? You, you see, for example, with astrology and crystals, that there's a lot of success in things that aren't claiming to be science. Mm. Why do you feel like there are so many products um, or if you have any insight on on why you think that might be? What oh. science gives to that? Oh, the whole, the yes, the wellness, the wellness industry and there's so many things like that. 
um, that are, you know, not regulated. And there's, I, it's so interesting. You're right, because it's like this, um, there is that often like, um, sort of like subtle, like suggestion of it being, sci you know, somehow the, the product of scientific research rather than just a guess. Um, I mean, I think it's, again, I think it's about teaching people critical thinking from a young age and encouraging that in children, which like, you know, it, I guess it's uh, in, on some level, adults want to be able to have, a, they don't want children to be asking really hard questions and saying, wait, but you said this a week ago and now you're saying that. And like, that's discouraged because it can make it very difficult to like get out the door in the morning. But if we encourage that and if we taught critical thinking to children and to say just because, I mean, it, it would be so good for their well-being and safety in so many ways. And one of the ways is the idea that when someone is trying to sell you something, like ask yourself, how do we know that this is true? And, you know, to be able to, um, but, you know, this is a thing that's a very old thing. You know, it's a, um, right, when we are ill, we want to be well. And when we feel we don't have options, especially in a country where, medical care is not fairly and evenly distributed to people. It's very difficult for a lot of people to get access to the best care geographically, economically, in all these different ways. Then how can we not long for another solution that's just a few clicks away, you know? Um, and I think that if we had one of the things that I think would help solve this, aside from really encouraging scientific literacy and critical thinking, um, would be if we had, uh, you know, better, better healthcare for everyone that was real, you know, medical science rather than the things that we w would love to be true of a magic cure, but alas, we don't have those for everything yet. Absolutely. Um, so going into springtime now, yes. it's officially April. Uh, my grandma always used to say April showers bring May yes, flowers. Yes, I've been saying that to myself a lot. <laughs> That's almost her springtime ritual. Yes, Every time yes. she'll say, spring has sprung, the grass has risen. I yeah. wonder where the birdies is. <laughs> uh, so I guess as a final question, um, what is one thing that you encourage everyone to do this, this, this spring, whether it's a sort of ritual that you and your family do or something that you encourage people to do to just really appreciate life? Oh, what a great question. Um, it's so, I mean, I, I live um, near Boston now, but I grew up here in Ithaca, of course, and I, I love, you know, in these places where the weather um, and the flora change dramatically over the course of the year, the euphoria that I feel when it really feels like spring and just the dramatic visual change. It's an amazing thing for things to going to, from being like very gray um, to all of a sudden like technicolor green and pink and purple. It's amazing. And I think anything we can do to really soak that in and take pleasure in that is worth doing. But I will share my the springtime ritual that I grew up with thanks to my mom and that I'm now passing on to my daughter is that I write about it in the book. It's called Blossom Day. And um, when I was a kid, there was a dogwood tree. It's actually still there. There is a dogwood tree outside the dining room window of my mother's house. Um, and um, when it started to have blossoms on it, we would have like a tea party um, celebration. And it was like, and now, so now I live somewhere else, but we also have beautiful trees out the window. And we, my daughter and I chose one when we moved into our house about a year and a half ago. And when that blooms, it's blossom day and we have a little celebration. And I think what it does is it peels back the specifics and makes, I mean, we have so many celebrations around the world around this time and Easter and Passover and Holy, all, you know, they have different um, stories laid over this experience. But the idea that rebirth is happening and, you know, we survived the winter, which, you know, now it's kind of like, oh, we made it, that was such a drag. But for most of human history, it was a real concern, like, would we literally survive? And I think that that pleasure um, is just something so ancient and so magnificent. And I think that take, you know, if you, if you are devoutly religious and you have 
a holiday around this time of year, great. And we do, you know, a secular version of several of those holidays. But I think also just ha taking a moment to just have the pure, um, unfiltered joy that comes from nature coming back to life so viscerally um, is really, it's, it's, it's worth taking a little afternoon to do that, I truly believe. Definitely. Um, so as we wrap up here, is there anything that you want readers and viewers of The Sun to know? Uh, anything you want to highlight? Or also, do you guys have any questions? I would just say that, you know, I, I grew up here, but it's been about 24 years since I lived in Ithaca. And every time I come home, I am um, so overjoyed with what a special place this is. And so anyone living here, you know, as a student or living here long term, just know um, that Ithaca is really, um, it's a really, really special, magical place. And enjoy, enjoy these moments, especially in the springtime here. So uh, your father, Carl Sagan, is one of the most popular and beloved science communicators of all time. And your mother as well is very well known for being an amazing writer and producer. Uh, how has growing up with such strong influences in your life created who you are as a person today and sort of led to the formation of, of this philosophy? Oh, I mean, it, they are, my parents are both absolutely like central to all of this. I really do feel like so grateful to have, you know, uh, like been brought up by them and, and this sense of enthusiasm and joy that, you know, millions of people around the world got to see on, you know, in Cosmos, which my mother continues to um, write and produce and direct today. Um, and, you know, you can get a glimpse of what it was like to grow up in the household where there was just so much of a sense of wonder and awe for nature as revealed by science. And I mean, I sort of mentioned this before, but one of the greatest gifts they gave me was the encouragement to ask a million questions. And they loved when I would ask a question they didn't know the answer to. And we would, I write about this in the book too, we would like go over, I mean, this is really going to date myself, but like we'd go over to the Encyclopedia Britannica on, on the shelf and, um, you know, to try to find an answer and like look for clues um, to a deeper understanding as a kind of sacred family ritual um, was so, so, was such a great way to grow up. And, you know, my dad died in 1996 when I was 14. And I think, you know, when you lose someone you love, especially when you're young and they're young, you know, it's just that it just became the defining experience of my life and trying to find a way to navigate grief without religion is sort of what led me many years later to write this book and to be interested, you know, in how we mark time and how we process change as human beings um, through the lens of their philosophy. And, um, you know, I, I just, I feel like um, when I, I meet a lot of people who were brought up very devoutly religious and left um, a religion and, you know, or I hear from them online or whatever. And I really have so much admiration for that because that is so hard to do. Um, and I can't, <laughs> you know, I feel like I just, I'm just carrying on the, um, the, legacy, I hope, of my parents rather than going in some other direction. And when I meet someone who's who's come to this worldview on their own, I just think that takes so much courage. And I'm always very, very impressed when I hear those stories. Um, well, thank you again, Sasha, for coming and, and chatting with us today. And thank you to our viewers. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you, Lane. Thanks, everyone.